Hello and welcome to Forty Guard Live. I'm Derek Mankey, and joining me today, once again, it's great to always see you, is uh, Marla County. How are you doing, Amar? Living the dream, as always. Living the dream. Yeah, and it's been busy, hasn't it? It's a busy. Always, day. always. But that's what keeps life interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of good news out there. We always talk about um, all, all the, the things that we're keeping eyes on, but the good thing is we're seeing this. There's been a flurry of activity on the threat landscape, but also with our uh, Forty Guard Labs research and response. So uh, top of mind, uh, just uh, recently, of course, we had um, spring shell or spring force shell. And of course, you know, when you get that, <laughs> when you get that shell word in there from everything we just went through in, um, you know, the, the end of last year with log force shell, there's a lot of panic and, and I think a lot of um, memories from, from last quarter, let's say, right? But, you know, in reality, uh, let's just walk through what, what this was. So we put out a threat signal on this. We did create a, um, uh, an outbreak notice on 40guard.com as well, showing our fabric coverage for it. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the good news is patch was readily available. It wasn't this group of, of four, you know, week after week, new, uh, uh, new vulnerabilities that were being exploited at rapid speed. We definitely didn't see that in this case with the uh, spring, spring shell, right? Yeah, I think we're going to keep an eye on it. So first of all, I think it's kind of funny. I think everything's going to have a, a number four, like log four shell on it. It made sense with log four J and log four shell, right. but with the spring framework, I'm not sure how much sense it makes, but you know what? We don't get to name these things all the time. So uh, that's what it is. But but you're right. Basically, spring is a framework for um, basically developers, for Java developers to go in and manipulate and look and access properties of uh, code, of developing code much easier. What this uh, what this vulnerability does is it basically allows them, um, you know, access, easy access to, uh, pro uh, to prop objects, property objects, as well as uh, the childlike information that's in those properties. Uh, that includes like things like names, addresses, email addresses, uh, passwords, other things as well. And that's, of course, a problem. Now, obviously, like we've been preaching secure development for a long time. A lot of organizations have been. So I, I always have to ask myself, what's the real risk with, like, you know, uh, with, uh, with this exploit? And the real risk is that attackers can go in and change the properties to modify code and make code run in a certain way. Essentially, they could make code executable, remote executable. Of course, I am simplifying this quite a bit. Uh, you know, you read our blog, read our, uh, you know, our threat signals to really understand the detail. But essentially what it does is attackers can go in and run a code remotely. They could change something like the Apache logging services and uh, change that to execute code. And once you execute code, you can essentially do anything you want. At that point, there's already tons of attacks that are built in for remote executable on a number of server services and servers and applications running. Yeah, and I think uh, so. This was heavily used in the retail sector, as an example. I know RHI SAC put out a notice who we're a partner with as well. Um, there's uh, you know a, a wide deployment base, but I don't think still the same level that we saw with Log4j. And going back to the you talked about this, the, you're simplifying it, right? Like the the ease of exploitation, I don't think is in the same league as it was with uh, Log4j either, right? Yeah, absolutely. It takes a uh, it takes a little bit more work to like exploit this. You have to know a little bit more what you're doing, and you, I, I don't know if you have to be familiar with the with the Spring framework, but uh, you at least have to know how to use that to to be able to exploit this. So I think there's a little bit more level of sophistication, and also Spring was really quick to update their framework, so the vendor actually updated um, everything really fast and. Like Fortinet, uh, you know, our uh, IPS signatures came out very fast. A lot of other vendors were on top of this as well. So it was a good way of the, I would say, the cybersecurity community, um, you know, basically coming together and responding, even if they were responding individually on coming up with protections for organizations that they help protect. Yeah, I, I, that's a great point. And I think that is a best case scenario. I mean, we had coverage within 24 hours on our end. Apache was readily available. When you have both of those combined, that is really the best case scenario. And I think it reflects in the data. Like I said, we haven't seen mass exploitation of this like we did with Log4j. And obviously, we continue to monitor it, like you said. Um, but that is that is the, the good news of this. I think um, without having that you know, effective, quick response, both from the security, uh, the security industry, but also from uh, the vendor too, um, the damage could definitely be a lot worse, right? 
Yep. I mean, we'll we'll keep an eye on it because, you know, historically there has been this like ramp up curve on more complicated an exploit is on how easily it's weaponized, how widespread we see it. Um, and uh, normally it does take a little bit of time for that to like get into like other products, other testing tools, other places where it can be exploited as well. Um, hopefully we're not going to see that. Hopefully we'll see a flat, <laughs> like a, like a yep. flat line instead of a, a up, upstream curve, but uh, you never know. We just want to keep an eye on things and see like how how this is weaponized. You know what payloads I may be in and what other attacks that I may be incorporated into. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think the good news is by having that upfront response, it really puts the attackers at a disadvantage, right? Because um, time is not on their side when patches have been available, and, and they they give organizations more time to patch and put more security controls in place before they actually, you know, it's, it's that classic arms race, right? But I think we really got ahead of it this time before they could, you know, even when they do roll it out into their attack kits and it becomes more commoditized, it's going to be less effective as, as a weapon. So so that's the good news there. As you said, we'll keep in mind, uh, sorry, an eye on it. And our minds, of course, always top of mind. Um, uh, so going back to the, uh, you mentioned curves, uh, upward curves, and I think of trends, right? And one of the trends we're seeing, uh, uh, we've seen this year, has unfortunately been what we talked about in our threat predictions um, that we released at the end of last year, predicting that we're going to see more aggressive uh, malware, destructive malware, in, in the, specifically in the form of wiper and wiper malware. And we have seen a lot of these, uh, relatively a lot of these this year already, which is very concerning. You know, we would often only talk about this maybe once a year uh, in the past, once or twice a year. Um, you know, by my count, we've put out over five threat signals on wiper malware just in the first quarter of uh, of this year. And that is that is a lot relatively. And you got to think that these, that you know, so I'm talking about things like uh, hermetic wiper, double zero caddy wiper, um, things that uh, have different techniques, right? To do master, not just master boot record, uh, overriding that to effectively wipe the system because that's not as sophisticated, but full blown partition wipers as well too. And, um, you know, what's concerning is this combination that we talked about before, when this starts to be hooked up into cyber criminal enterprise to use as part of their playbook for ransom attacks and effectively using that as a threat, right? Right. I mean, um, you know how time flies. I can't believe, you know, it's already been a month that we're into 2022. And remember talking to you in early January where we where we were talking about, hey, this is probably a threat and a trend we're going to start seeing heavily in 2022 and becoming more and more common that attackers are not, you know, they're migrating. I wouldn't say they're migrating away from ransomware because it's a different goal for ransomware. You know, ransomware, you're encrypting data, but you're hopefully going to get that data back if someone pays if a victim pays in this case you're just completely destroying data uh, sometimes there's a threat of just destroying data so there is a ransom component to that but um this is much more aggressive as you said it's much more malicious and uh, vindictive as, in ways too and i think a lot of the wiper where, where we are seeing there's also allegedly you know or at least some speculation that this may be uh state sponsored or it may be uh uh you know um like kind of, kind of kind of at least motivated you know from uh, people in different states with different you know uh, political happenings around the world that's happening right now so uh, so it's much more cyber warfare I would say in my opinion and it's a lot more scarier because you're not getting that data back and the goal is to really disrupt uh, you know a local civilization I would say in that particular geo area where it's being targeted at. Yeah, and it's it's a bit of both, which is also equally concerning, right? Because there's absolutely that concern. But like I said, traditionally, you wouldn't see destructive threats in the world of cyber crime because they want to monetize, right? So they want they want to be able to obviously not completely cripple systems, um, but they want to be able to put, put a business model for it and, and be able to monetize and make some money off of it. Um, but that's a concerning thing is that we're seeing this destructive payload now also we have seen some indications thankfully not a lot yet but i think that's still to come but yeah, absolutely you have these sort of two worlds now that are converging there right and um it's definitely a, a concern you know i'm talking between apt groups and cyber criminal groups too right exactly exactly i mean we have cyber crime converging with like cyber warfare essentially and that's that's what we're seeing in the evolution of this type of malware yeah yeah 
definitely. Um, and, you know, to add another layer on top of that, now the most re one of the most recent threat signals that we put out was on acid rain. Uh, so this is another destructive payload that was actually going after satellite communications. Again, another threat that we talked about in our predictions at the end of last year. Um, and this whole idea, again, is not trying to, you know, uh, take down satellites from the sky, but really go after the ground stations, right? Where all that traffic is flowing to, to be able to hit things like OT networks that are actually, that are off grid, but now connected through SATCOM. And that's precisely what we talked about in the threat signal and released with acid rain. Um, this even went a step further in technique because it was actually attacking the firm firmware itself, effectively, um, you know, destroying those communications, right? And that is um, uh, very concerning as well. Uh, you, you know, I, I feel like the headline attacks from space can be a, a good talk and it can be, a, you know, maybe a good movie as well, like a, like a zombie a war, war movie. But, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the reality is that, um, you know, these uh, uh, distributed wide area networks, these perimeter access points are being yep. attacked. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility in these attacks. Acid rain is malware that was essentially destroying to simplify again, modems, connectivity modems. When you're looking yep. at satellite communications, you have like three major components, right? You have the low orbit satellite or, or, or orbital satellites, right? They're usually beaming to a ground station. Uh, and then from the ground station, you have connectivity back you know, to uh, the customer network or to the on-premise network. Uh, that can be a hard line, that can be for a different ISP. There's a variety of different ways, but there's usually some sort of connectivity box. Let's call it a modem. That's essentially what it is. Like you have a cable modem, you have a satellite modem as well. And that's what's, that, that is what this malware specifically attacks is that basically end connectivity device, that, that modem. And as you know, because of satellites, because of the flexibility of satellites about because you don't need hard wires at, at, everywhere, that modem can be put in a variety of different places, including very remote places. Um, acid rain, I thought was interesting because, uh, you know, it was reported by a couple of security blogs and uh, publications that around five to six thousand wind turbines were taken down. Uh, remote access to manage these wind turbines were taken down because they uh, because the malware had attacked those modems so that the administrators can no longer remote access them or remote uh, administer them. And uh, that's just one example of, you know, attacks building on each other. You have like basically satellite attacks now basically affecting the OT world and wind turbines, which affects, you know, people getting energy, keeping the lights on, which is a little scary thing. And this is exactly the scenario that we played out in the predictions as well, talking about specifically OT environments, things that would be in remote areas and off grid that would rely on sat satellite communications. And um, no doubt, I think, again, going back to that, what we just talked about before, the APT groups versus, not versus, but <laughs> converging with cybercrime, we're going to probably see more of that, these sort of targets in the, in the playbooks of attackers, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, let's 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 end on some good news. As I said, we we always talk about the, um, the 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 trends that we're seeing and the on the actual attack surface. Um, there's always some good positive results that we get from this. Recently, there was another arrest made. This is a good trend, right? We've talked about this before. Uh, there's been more resources put into arrest prosecutions, recovery of funds, even in some cases. Uh, and th there's a lot of reasons for that that we've covered before. Uh, the most recent one was with uh, Lapsus Group. Right. Um, but what was interesting about this was that the individuals arrested, you know, we always talk about cyber criminal ecosystems and you think of these big criminal enterprise, which they are. But, you know, in reality, what what was uh, what, what was released was that the uh, individuals arrested were teenagers in this case. Right. Yeah. So uh, UK authorities had uh, identified several individuals that they are, uh, you know, allegedly, I believe, that are connected to the Lapsus group. These individuals are ranging from 13 to like 17, 18, if I uh, remember correctly. Uh, you know, the two uh, arrests on record were made, uh, I think the individuals were identified as 15 year olds. And so we have, uh, you know, me and you were talking about this is now, now we have a lot of essentially kids that are in cyber crime organizations, cyber crime groups, you know, Lapsus is a well-known group. They take advantage of, of a lot of social engineering. Uh, you know, when they, when they do their attacks, they're not necessarily buying zero days. They're not a zero day, uh, you know, repository uh, or go on marketplaces. They're really doing a lot of older attacks and social engineering attacks. And it makes me think like, okay, these, people have the skills right now to do very sophisticated attacks and to trick people, you know, what can we do to like 
you know, make these skills for the better. Because there's no doubt a lot of people that are using these skills, uh, you know, they're, they're probably thinking of a way to make their lives better. Maybe they're in a situation where they feel like this is the only way they can get out of that situation. Uh, and they're making a lot of money. Like some of the Bitcoin wallets associated with Lapsus have been found to be in excess of $15 million. So we're talking about a lot of money out here. So, uh, you know, that's a lot of motivation for people to do cyber crime. But perhaps it's also motivation for them to be on the good side of the force as well. Absolutely. And this is exactly why I think it's critical, right? The importance of all the work we're doing in the industry, especially if you look at the um, Security Academy and, and our uh, NSC Institute, that whole cyber, uh, the skills gap conversation that we have, the more that we fill, the more good paths that we create, right? And I think that is definitely the, the, the answer forward for that. But, it, you know, at the same time, having arrests like this sends a message that this is not okay. Right. And, and that, um, and that's a strong message, I think, right. That no one is invincible to this. And I think that, you know, we need to keep on following that, of course. And that's why we work well, obviously with our law enforcement partners and we do all, all the work that we do uh, because, you know, left unchecked, the problem continues to grow. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember when I was a kid, it was like a, it was a joke. It was like a fantasy that you hacked into some uh, big organization and they were going to offer you this crazy job. And that that's not reality. I mean, the reality is that there is a, a lot of aggressive prosecution on, um, on, cr on criminal activity, especially cybercrime. And yeah. authorities are, uh, you know, going after that. We've seen that definitely here in the United States and uh, as well in a lot of other countries as well. So, you know, that this is not the way to make a name for yourself, right? I know if me and you are hiring people, we're not going to be impressed by someone that's, you know, done a lot of cybercrime where we're going to be like questioning that resume. The way to get ahead of the, uh, uh, there's a lot of other ways to get ahead in this industry, a lot uh, and a lot of good ways, right? I mean, with uh, yeah. open source software, publishing your own YouTube channels, uh, blogging, right? And, uh, and I think uh, this does send a good message going aggressively after cyber criminals and prosecuting them. Uh, this send a message that, uh, you know, not to sound cliche, crime doesn't pay, right? And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and, and it's not a, a slap on the wrist either. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is a significant, right? It, it, it's going to affect the rest of their lives. And so, yeah. But the good thing is there is a lot of opportunity to go on the good side and use those, yeah. uh, use that intelligence and that talent for good. Absolutely. All right, Amar, uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts with me again. It's always great to, to speak with you. And um, we will continue to monitor everything that we talked about, of course. So stay tuned. I'm Derek Menke with Fortigard Live, signing off. Thanks.